now we consider control flow in a program when we write instructions one after another they are executed in the sequence in which they are given c++ permits us to combine all instructions written in one sequence and put them in a block so everything put inside a block is considered equivalent of one instruction for example these are three instructions assume that they are all defined as integer these three instructions are executed one after another but suppose i want to combine them and treat them logically as if there was a single instruction then i can do that by writing an opening bracket here and a closing curly bracket here so whatever comes inside an opening curly bracket and closing curly bracket is logically considered as equivalent to one instruction when program is executed all these instructions will be executed in fact c++ says it doesn't matter what kind of instructions you put inside opening curly bracket and last curly bracket there may be if then else there may be conditional there may be iteration whatever whatever all of that is treated as one block and equivalent of one instruction therefore whenever c++ permits you to write one instruction and if you have to write more instead of one you always put a block start end so all that is equivalent of logically one instruction is that clear this is how the sequential instructions are written. but sometimes i want to execute conditional just to recall the flow chart suppose i have a flow chart which says read x and y you understand this logic i want to read two values x and y compare which is greater and whichever is greater i want to assign it to z so after executing this z should be the larger of the two now i can't write a sequential statement so for that you have the if statement in the if statement you will write this as is this clear to everybody so what does the if statement do it checks if x is greater than y only if that condition is true it will execute that statement if that condition is not true it will execute the statement written after else okay the logic for this is now this is very important to note that the if statement permits exactly one statement to be written after if 
and exactly one statement to be written after else. You can't write 20 statements that if x is greater than y, then do this, do this, do this, do this. Else, do that, do that, do that, do that. There is no direct method of writing such a thing in C++. You can write, if x greater than y, do this. Else, do that. That's all. This and that, one statement only. That is why the format of description of if statement in C++ books you will find says if condition, statement 1, else, statement. But suppose you have to do many things. If x greater than y, do this, do this, do this, do this, else, do that, do that, do that, do that. Then how will you write? Curly bracket, because of the C++ rules, that whatever you write in a curly bracket pair is one statement. So, you can write, if You understood this? Sometimes if you miss curly bracket, there is a problem. Sometimes we deliberately don't write curly bracket because we have only one statement to execute. So please remember, if only one statement is to be executed, then you write it without curly bracket. But otherwise you must always write it. And as a result, I have been suggesting that a good programming practice is always to put curly bracket. Even if there is one statement, there is no harm. Because later on, if you suddenly remember, oh, if that condition is true, apart from this, I also have to do this and this, then I can insert it and it will not be a mistake because I will be putting that inside the curly bracket. Is that clear? Okay. What if I write only one statement? Let's say, What will this program do? It will root, read two values, m and n. If m is greater than n, then p is equal to m and output p. So, suppose the values given are say 7 and 5. What will happen? What will be the output produced? Huh? p is equal to 7, so output will be 7. Suppose the value given is 2 and 9. Now what will happen? There is no question of no output. C++ is like a Rakshas or a Jinn. So, bola output to output dega. This is very, very important to understand. Why you are seeing no output first of all? Because you have not assigned any value to P. If M is 2 and N is 9, then you read M and N. If M greater than N, is it true? No. So, P is equal to M will not be executed because that condition is not true. The next instruction says output P. Please remember that when you write this program, the compiler would have assigned locations, one for M, one for N, one for P, in some memory other thing. Now in this case, when M is 7 and N is 5, P will get a value assigned which is 7. But if M is 2, N is 9, P will not get assigned any value. How do we represent such values? We write a question mark inside. Saying we don't know. It's very important to understand that we don't know. And when we don't know, C++ also does not know. So, 
Suppose you are executing this program just now on a Ubuntu machine. There are memory locations, millions of memory locations. And when the program is compiled and loaded for execution, M, N and P have been assigned some locations. Each one of those locations contains some value from the past. We don't know what that value is. When you say C in M and N, the two values will come and replace whatever trash you had earlier. But P ko to kuch kya nahi, you have not done anything to P. P will continue to have some trash value which will be printed. So, if P for example contains minus 17345, then what will it print? It will print minus 13745. Now, here is the curious possibility. Suppose this contains 9. Suppose this contains 9. What will it print? 9. Now, what will you think? You once run a program with 7 and 5, it prints 7. Then you run a program with 2 and 9, it prints 9. You will think it is finding out the maximum. This should tell you that you should never test your program only with one data value or even with two data values because such initialization mistakes will not be caught. If by freak accident, this is an accident. See, there are how many numbers possible? Exactly nine to be there will be very unlucky for you. But suppose I am unlucky, then I would like to remove the element of luck by running it again with say 2 and 11. Now I have to be very, very unlucky if next time the location which is assigned contains 11. That is the reason why apart from testing, you have to ensure that values are either initialized or assigned. No value should be printed which is a trash value. Is that clear? Of course the correct thing would be to say if m greater than n, p equal to m, else p equal to n. If you want to find out the maximum. But there are occasions when you want to do something only if condition is true, not otherwise. In which case you are welcome to do that. What are the possible conditions that you can write? Greater than, less than, greater than, equal to, less than equal to can I write equal to no if I want to compare whether m is equal to n very important if you don't write it it will mean something else complete and how do I say not equal to how do I say not equal Is this what I write? Exclamation mark. Okay. So please remember these are basic comparison operators. Now when I compare, sometimes I want to write complex conditions. A greater than B and X less than Y. So how will I write that? I will say A greater than B Now, how do you know that it will not do B and and Y, B and and X? Because in comparison operators and logical operators, there is a priority. And logical operator and or etc. have a lower priority than this. However, it is always safer, always safer to write this in a bracket, write this in a bracket. This is the well-formed condition. And if you want to write an if statement, you have to preclude it by one more pair of back. Because if statement requires a bracket, and the bracket pair in which you write it. And then you write your statement. Is that okay? How do you write or? This is where you write two vertical bars. And you can also write not of a condition by preceding it with an exclamation mark. So, and or not, these are the logical operators that you have. 
apart from if then else there is also a possibility of you are saying if yeah oh sorry i thought somebody had a question this is okay if condition 1 what will be the meaning of this if first condition is true you execute else s1 if the first condition is not true then only you come down now you examine condition 2 if condition is true then you execute s2 else when you come here please note that both condition 1 is must be not true and condition 2 also must be not true then only you will come here. and if this condition is also not true then only you will execute s so s4 will be executed if condition 1 is not true and condition 2 is not true and condition 3 is not true so depending upon how you want to write your logic you can use this this is called an if else if ladder so instead of writing complicated if this then if this then if this else this else this else this you can use this ladder to compose your logic more correct is that okay fine suppose this is the problem you are given find the sum of the series 1 plus x plus x square plus x cube plus something for some given value of x which is less than 1 by adding all those terms which are greater than 0.001 so suppose x is equal to 0.8 now first term is 1 plus 0.8 let me say for example then we have to add 1 plus 0.8 plus 0.8 square how much will it be point Plus x cube. How much it will be? Point. Five. Point six four into point eight. So how much is it? This. Five two four or five one two. When in doubt, do it the hard way. 
64 multiplied by 8, 8 fours are 32, carry 3, 8 sixes are 48, 48 plus 3, 51. This is decimal point, this is decimal point, so 1, 2, 3 decimal point, 0.512. How how did somebody get 0.524? I am very curious. And that's it. Please note the term. Term is x cube. So that's it. Anyway, now we know two things. The terms are indeed reducing. So somewhere some term will become less than 0.001. After that, I don't have to add, but I don't know how many terms where I will have to add. I may have to add 200, 300, 500, 74 terms. I don't know, but I have to keep adding till a term becomes less than something, right? So how will I do that? That is where I need iterative thing. I know each term. Each term is x multiplied by the previous term. Okay, each term is x multiplied by the previous term. First term is what? One. So now, if I start with one, and then keep adding new terms to the sum and finding new term, new term is equal to old term multiplied by x. If old term is one, new term will be x. Next time, new term should become old term, and this should be multiplied by x. So, if I say term is equal to term multiplied by x. Every time I recalculate it, it will keep growing. This suggests to me that if I define float x term sum, and I set up an iteration of this type, I start by saying c in. Then I say. Term is equal to one, or if you want zero point zero, better way of writing it. Can you check whether this program will work? First of all, tell me whether you understand what this program will do. It is setting up an iteration. It says while term is greater than 0.001, keep on doing this. What am I doing? This means what? I do two things. One, whatever is the term which is greater than 0.001, I add it to sum. And I prepare the next term for the next iteration. So I multiply the present term by x; it will become term into x. That is the new term. And when I go back to the next iteration, that term will be examined. If you have any doubt, you should always write values of term and sum, and find out. What will happen? So well, let's execute this algorithm. Let us assume that c in as input is given 0.8. So I write term is one, sum is zero, and x is 0.8. Agreed. The first three statements: c in x will get you x as 0.8. Term is equal to one will get you term as one. Sum is equal to 0.0 will get you sum as 0.0. Fine. Right? Now I come to while. While term greater than 0.001, is term greater than 0.001? Of course, it is one. So yes, 
therefore I go inside the loop. Inside the loop, what do I do? Sum is equal to sum plus term. So what will happen? Sum is 0, term is 1, this will be replaced by 1. Sum is equal to sum plus term. The next statement says, term is equal to term into x. So what will happen to term? Term is 1, 1 into 0.8, so it will be 0.8. Now I come to closing curly bracket. Closing curly bracket means what? Iteration is over. Go back and check the condition again. So I go back and check what condition? Is term greater than 0 0.001? It is. What is my term? 0 0.8. So I come inside the iteration again. This time what is the statement? Same statement is executed, which is sum is equal to sum plus term. So what is sum? 1. Term? 0.8. So what will be the sum? 1.8. Again, term is recast. Term is equal to term into x. So this will become how much? 0 0.64. And again, I come to the closing curly bracket. I am thrown back again. Examine term. Term is 0 0.64 greater than 0 0.001. Come inside the iteration. Sum is equal to sum plus term. This time it will become how much? 1.2. And next is term is equal to term into x. So how much term will become? 0 0.512. We do it just only this much. But we now confirm, one, terms are getting correctly calculated and they are getting correctly added. So now let this iteration run. Let it calculate thousand terms. I don't have to do godagiri of thousand additions myself. But program will work correct. Do you see how, how such iterations are to be set up? Okay. Suppose I want to set up an iteration which will add n terms where n is given to you. Say n is 5000. Somebody says add 5000 terms. I don't care what is the last term where. Add 5000 terms or add 250 terms. So if I have to do that, how will I set up the iteration? Let's go back to that slide. So what our friend is asking is, can I directly use the maths library which will find the exponential of x? What is the definition of e to the power x? Is it 1 plus x plus x square plus x cube? A naya exponential defined kar apne. Anybody remembers what is the standard exponential definition? e to the power x? x x raised to the nth term is typically x to the power n upon n factorial bappa. It's a completely different series. In fact, you will not come to write a program if standard functions are available because for standard function there are tables available also. Easy. Okay. And those, yes, you can use library functions in such cases. So cos theta, sin theta, e to the power x, log x, you can use the standard function. Many times what happens is that standard functions is not what you are interested in summing. Okay, that is why you have to use this. Second point, even if it was a standard function, okay, suppose I pose it as a programming problem, standard function value will not fall from sky, no? So even for standard function somebody has to calculate. Now what you are saying is, some joker has done that work some 50 years ago, he has written something called library, let me use it. Very good. But tomorrow if you have to be that joker, whose work others will use, then you should be able to write that program. And that is what we are trying to learn in this course. 
Of course, we would like to use others' programs, but we would like to learn to write programs ourselves. So now, just because he has suggested this, let us write a program to calculate e to the power x. But first, let me complete this part. We will come to that problem also because that is an important issue. So, same series, 1 plus x plus x square plus x is 12, but I want to add n terms of the same series. There are two ways of doing this. First way, I do the same thing. I say float x term sum. Now I have to add n terms, so I will define an integer n. And now, since I have to do some counting, I will define a counting variable, say c. Now earlier what I did, I said c in input x. But I should also read one more value, n, how many terms I want to add, n may be 5000, 15000, whatever. Please note that this is a simplified version. I would ordinarily say C out, give value of n, then C in n, then C out, give value of x, then C, C in x, etc. But this is a simplified one. So suppose these values are read. Now I have to do exactly the same thing that I did earlier, that while loop is correct. But I have to add one more condition of counting. It is not, the condition is now not based on value of x. It is based on counting. So, I will of course start with term equal to 1, sum is equal to 0, 0, but I will also say count is equal to 0. Let us, let us say I start with count equal to 0. Now, I put my condition while count I want to add n times my addition and term calculation is going to be same but let me try to put this here c is initially 0 let us say n is 10 so 0 is less than 10 I will necessarily come inside I will add the first term that I have calculated earlier sum is equal to sum plus term and then I recalculated term is equal to term multiplied by x. Earlier I was checking whether term was greater than 0 0.001. Now term has no role in decision making. I am counting. So obviously once I do something I should increase the count. Next time I do again increase the count. So I should also say c is equal to c plus 1. Now let us see how it will execute. Let us assume n is equal to 3. I want to add 3 terms. Let us confirm whether this will add 3 terms or not. First time c is 0, you come inside what you are doing, sum is equal to sum plus term. You are adding the first term. Now you increase the term, c becomes now c plus 1, which is 1. Is 1 less than 3? Yes. You will again come inside. Now this time you will add 1 plus x, because term would have become x. Again c becomes 2. Is c greater than, uh, less than 3? Yes. Again third time you come inside. Term is added, 1 plus x plus x square. Term now becomes x cube, okay. c becomes 3, you go back, is 3 less than 3? No, so you will come out. So it is correctly adding. The point is, you want to do it 3 times. So you can count 0, 1, 2, or you can even count 5, 6, 7. From 5 you can start counting up to 7. But since n is given, the upper limit is known to you in terms of n. 
you can either start from zero and count up to n minus one, or you can start with one and count up to equal to n. So as long as it is less than equal to n, you can continue. So one to less than equal to n, or zero to less than n, both are equal. Okay. Now the second way of writing this is all of this will remain same. Same, same, same. Here I will simply say term is equal to one, sum is equal to zero point zero, and now I will say for Everybody understands this. This is the for loop, counting loop. Note that there are three things specified in this loop. One is this, second is this, third is this. This is executed before you enter the loop only once, first time. Before you come to the for statement itself, c equal to zero is executed. This is exactly equivalent to doing it here. They are equal. C equal to zero specifying here and writing C equal to zero in a statement before you come to while is exactly. Next, you check C less than n. That is the while equivalent. While C less than n, do this. So the second part in the for is the condition. The third part is the increment part which is executed at the end. So whatever you have written here, this is to be written here. So these are equivalent. Understood? This is very simple and a straightforward counting iteration. And in fact, when we use arrays, we extensively use this construct. But there can be many variations in this construct. For example, the simplest variation is you rarely write c equal to c plus 1. What do you write instead? c plus plus. Not the c plus plus compiler, but variable c incremented by 1. Okay. Okay, so find out what is the value of k that will be printed.
Okay, what's your answer? Everybody. Why? K has not been initialized. Instead, in this program, I have stupidly initialized I, which was not necessary, because the false statement was going to initialize I anyway. But K, which I am changing, is not initialized at all. Of course, can you say none of these always? Because of the bad luck factor. If that location for K contains zero, then you may get the right answer. But that is chance. By and large, none of these is the right answer. Now suppose I say K is equal to zero. Tell me what will be the answer? Now you have to do some work. Earlier was easy. So do it. Find out what is the value of K. Execute it. How much will it be? Huh? Ten. Pakka. Definite. Okay. Why? Tell me how, how you execute. The, the iteration is executed five times. And every time in that iteration, k is incremented twice. So, k plus plus, k plus plus. So, therefore, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Okay. If you have understood this counting, you have understood everything. Because that is how the iterations work. You have to find out how many times that iteration executes. And those many times the internal statements will be executed, you will be able to find out. There is another form of uh, iteration which is not very often used, but it is also equally important. And that iteration is of the type do something, something, something. This statement actually has this something followed by something followed by something done first then there is a condition check and if the condition is true you go back here if the condition is false you come out here so what is the difference between this and the while the while condition is checked before you enter the iteration. Here, the condition is checked at the end of the iteration. So, usually do is used when for the first time you necessarily want to execute the body of the iteration. You don't want to check the first execute, then check. If that is your logic, use this. If you want to the first check, then execute and come back, then you use while. And for fixed number of times you want to execute, for. So these are the three possible choices and once you understand the logic you should be able to figure that. Okay. With this we now move over to discuss arrays. When I declare something like this, what happens? Fifty elements get allocated space. So A50 stands for equivalent of fifty variables, all of type integer. Array has to be a collection of the same type. How is the first element identified of the array? And the last element is identified as? The important point is that C++ says that you can also write A, J. Whenever you write J, it means whatever is the value of J, you are referring to that element. So if J is 5, you are referring to A5. J is 0, you are referring to A0. J is 49, you are referring to A49. J is 500.
What are you referring? Error? Question, what will happen? What does C++ do? Sorry? Garbage value from where? See, garbage value is used in your program if the location that you have defined has not been initialized by you. Some old value will be there. But A500, some old value where? Earlier it was say N or X or something. So there was a location. What is A500? The location itself is not defined. So what will C++ do? No, it will not show an error. He is right, but he is not completely right. What C++ does is important to understand. C++ does not show an error. C++, unfortunately, while executing your program, does not do checking whether your index is within the range 0 to 49 or not. That is your responsibility. What it says? Oh, you say A500. This is A0, this is A1, A2, A3, A49, A50, A51, A52. I will go that corner, A500, somewhere here, some location. In this location, you might have a floating point variable Z. Then it will pick up that value. Worse, this location may not be in your program. It may be his program. He is executing something. And he has some N or something. Okay, or some P or whatever. Now, if memory is not protected, your memory and his memory separately, for computer is all one memory. So, you will say, AJ is equal to minus 5. And in his program, some variable will become minus 5. Is that okay? Maybe okay for you, but not for him. So, that is why computer systems protect programs. And they say, this is your segment of memory, that is his segment of memory. And you cannot go into his segment of memory. So that is why you sometimes get a fault called segmentation fault. Segmentation error, segment error means you are exceeding, Baba, tera ghar hai, you, you, this is your house, that is his house. You are not permitted to eat in your house and go there to sleep. You have to stay in your house only. So segmentation, but if the index is exceeded by some small value, typically by one value, say it becomes, instead of 0, it becomes minus 1, instead of 49, it becomes 50, then invariably you will still be within your segment and it may create a problem. So your responsibility to ensure that the array index always remains between 0 and maximum limit minus 1, that is your response. Understood? Never make this error. So particularly when you say J and such things, then you have a problem of this kind. Okay. Let us now consider this array and my problem is put in values in successive elements of this array which is 5, 10, 15, 20, etc. That means there is an array, you have declared an array. Now I want you to write a program which will put these values. Zeroth element it will put 5, next element it will put 10, next element it will put 15, etc. How will I write a program? Okay. So I have, let us say, This will go through all the elements. Please remember for an array, if you want to scan all elements or if you want to do something with every element, the simplest thing is to set up a loop for some variable equal to 0 to n minus 1. So j less than 50 means this loop will execute 50 times. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 4. That is fine. Now I have to say something like aj 
equal to how much? First time when it executes the iteration, what should be the value? J equal to 0. Yeah, but what should be the value of A0? 5. Next time it should be 10. So it is increasing every time. 5 multiplied by 1, 5 multiplied by 2, 5 multiplied by 3. 1, 2, 3, 4 is 1 greater than J, which is 0, 1, 2, 3. So suppose I said J plus 1 into 5. Will I get the correct value? Did you all think of this logic? No. That is the point. That is the way you have to think. That I want to get a series 5, 10, 15, 20. Then that series, what is the nth term? Or jth term? Jth term is j plus 1 into 5. Once you get the jth term, you assign it. So this is how you can manipulate arrays. Is that, is that clear? Okay. You can also scan arrays. So how do you find the maximum element in an array? Just tell me whether this part of the program will read n elements in the array or not. I am reading the value of n and I am setting up a loop for i equal to 0 to n minus 1 input ai. There is only one problem. As a professional programmer, after reading n but before setting up a for loop, I should check whether n is less than 5000 and n is greater than or equal to 0. If n is less than 0, no problem. The loop will not execute at all. Nothing will be read. But if n is 10,000, I will have a problem. Same segmentation fault. You are reading values and putting those values in his house. Not permitted. So that cross check you can do. But otherwise, programming wise, this will work. Now I have to find out the maximum of these n elements. It's a very simple thing. I can start with max is equal to arbitrarily the zeroth element of the array and then I can say for i equal to 1 to i less than n i plus plus if Will this logic work? What we are doing is starting with max equal to 0 and then going through all the remaining elements 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And if any one of those elements is greater than the current max, I replace max by that. So I found that. Okay. Now I will give you a slightly complicated example. Let's say this is the last example we discuss.
read this problem and understand and tell me what have you understood. Try to construct a small example. Given an integer array which contains integer values, print those values which occur more than once in the array. That means all values are not unique. So let us construct an example. Let us say the array is 1, 12, 5, minus 7, 12, 12, 5. So this is an array. It contains some integers. You will notice that 1 happens to be only once. 12 happens to be 3 times. 5 happens to be twice. And minus 7 happens only once. So now what is the problem? Problem says those values which occur more than once. So which are those values? 12, 12, 12 and 5, 5. So print those values but print each value only once. How will you solve this? So what he is saying is, take one value and examine whether that value occurs in my array, in my entire array. If it occurs once, then count will be one. If it occurs more times, count will be more. And if the count is more, I will print it. So, suppose I follow this logic. Have you understood this logic? I will take each number separately. I will call it say element E. And I'll see if E is there, 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 there. Now somewhere it has to be there because I have picked up. But I'll scan the entire array. If it has occurred only once, count will be one. If it has occurred many times, count will be many more. So, I will assume that I have read n elements into the array, like we had done that just now. Now I start this. So I am looking at each element of the array in succession. I have to look at 0th element, then 1st, then 2nd, then 4th. Whichever element I am looking at, I am assigning it temporarily to a variable called EL. So EL is the element which I want to examine. If you look at this array, 1, 12, 5, minus 7, 12, 12, 5, I will be examining 1, then I will examine 12, then I will examine 5, then I will examine minus 7, 12, etc. Each one in turn. And what I am going to do, examination means, Take that element and check whether it exists anywhere in the array. So I want to, with respect to this element, I want to scan the entire array again. And wherever that any element is same as this, I want to increase the count. So I will set up another iteration which goes through the entire array once again. I will say now for j is equal to 0 to j less than n, j plus plus. If EL is equal to AJ, count plus plus, you see what I am doing? I have taken one EL. So for example, suppose I am somewhere 1, 12, 5, minus 7. Suppose I am at minus 7. My i is 0, 1, 2, 3. For i equal to 3, el will be what? Minus 7. a of minus 3. Now with minus 7, 
I start scanning the entire array for j equal to 0 to 7. So I'll check, is minus 7 equal to 1? Is minus 7 equal to 12? Is minus 7 equal to this? So if somewhere minus 7 will be equal to minus 7, count will become 1. Initially count was 0. Suppose I am examining 12, that is my i is equal to 1. When i is equal to 1, el is how much? a1. a0 is 1, a1 is 12. So el is equal to 12. Now with el equal to 12, for example, for i equal to 1, el will be 12. And I run this loop with el equal to 12. Now what happens in the inner loop? j is equal to 0 to n, n minus 1. So all elements are checked against el. Is el equal to ej? So is el equal to a0? No. Is el equal to a1? Yes. Count will become 1. Is el equal to 5? No. Is el equal to minus 7? No. Is el equal to 12? Yes. Count will increase one more time. That means when I come out here, if count is 1, then that element has occurred only once. If count is more than 1, then that element has occurred many times. So, if count equal equal 1, then the element has occurred once, else Right? Now I got two portions of my program. Count is one, it has occurred only once. If count is more than one, it has occurred many times. I could simply say in my program here, if count greater than one, see out EL, I'll print that. Print those values which occur more than once, my problem is solved. The second part of the problem is not easy. Print each such value only once. Imagine I start with 1, it will not be printed because 1 occurs only once. Then I come to 12, 12 occurs 3 times, my count will be 3, I will print 12. Then I go to 5, 5 occurs twice, 5 will also be printed. Then I come to minus 7, it will not be printed. But then I again come to 12 and with EL equal to 12, I go back to 0th element and again say, ah, 12 is there, 12 is here, count is 3 again, again it will be printed. So 12 will be printed 3 times, 5 will be printed twice. I have solved this problem partially, not fully. Sorry? Come again? No, break where? If I break, I will come out. And I will not examine any element after that. And suppose there are some other elements, I will not get them. So this is a hard problem. This is a hard problem. What you will have to do is, you will have to sort the array. You sort the array, ascending, descending, all or whatever. Now you examine successive element, 0th element, first element. Are they same? No, they are different. That different means that element is occurring only once. Forget that. Go to the next. Go to the next. But suppose you now find, oh, the next element is same. Now you stop there. You have found a fellow who is occurring many times. You print that fellow. But continue the checking. This fellow is same. Okay. Is this fellow also same? Is this fellow? Because when you sort, all the same elements will come together. Now if 12 occurs three times, it will come together three times. Then only some other number will come. When a next number comes, you forget this and start checking again. However, if the problem is only this, then you can do this here. If the problem is, it says, print those values which occur more than once. Why you are printing it three times, but that value is occurring more than once. So your answer is right. Suppose you have to print the values which occur only once. Then what will you do? Sorry? Ha, if count equal equal 1, 
see out that element el and that will happen only once so that you have no worry about you will never find it again suppose i said you take the values which occur uniquely and find their sum that means in this given problem i want to find the sum of 1 and minus 7 because 1 is unique minus 7 is unique what can i do first i define sum equal to 0 outside somewhere now i do the same logic if count equal equal 1 sum is equal to sum plus el that element not see out here i will complete that j loop i'll complete i loop and afterwards i'll say sum is equal to this so it's easy right everybody understood how you handle this okay there could be any number of squiggles or complications that may arise out of this but essentially if you have understood the logic that you may have to scan the array elements one by one you have to use a loop for a given element you may have to again scan that array or some other array you have to put an inner loop and you may have inner loop inner loop as many times as you want the logic is that you should be careful about what is i what is j what is k where you are using index and the logic should be when you should do what for example printing that sum you can't print the sum here this is inside this i loop so you close this i loop also you find the sum but print the sum outside because you have to calculate the sum of all elements which are unique no so you have found out only one here right now you have added it to sum when i changes you will find some other element all such elements will be combined only when you finish this and here you should print that sum is that understood okay i think we'll stop here